by acknowledging a petty problem you give it existence and credibility. The more attention you pay an enemy, the stronger you make him, and a small mistake is often made worse and more visible when you try to fix it. It is sometimes best to leave things alone. If there is something you want but cannot have, show contempt for it. The less interest you reveal, the more superior you seem. Desire often creates paradoxical effects, the more you want something, the more you chase after it, the more it eludes you. The more interest you show, the more you repel the object of your desire. This is because your interest is too strong it makes people awkward, even fearful. Uncontrollable desire makes you seem weak, unworthy, pathetic. You need to turn your back on what you want, show your contempt and disdain. This is the kind of powerful response that will drive your targets crazy. They will respond with a desire of their own, which is simply to have an effect on you perhaps to possess you, perhaps to hurt you. If they want to possess you, you have successfully completed the first step of seduction. If they want to hurt you, you have unsettled them and made them play by your rules. Contempt is the prerogative of the king. Where his eyes turn, what he decides to see, is what has reality, what he ignores and turns his back on is as good as dead. That was the weapon of King Louis XIV if he did not like you, he acted as if you were not there, maintaining his superiority by cutting off the dynamic of interaction. This is the power you have when you play the card of contempt, periodically showing people that you can do without them. If choosing to ignore enhances your power, it follows that the opposite approach commitment and engagement often weakens you. By paying undue attention to a puny enemy, you look puny, and the longer it takes you to crush such an enemy, the larger the enemy seems. When Athens set out to conquer the island of Sicily, in 415 BC a giant power was attacking a tiny one. Yet by entangling Athens in a long-drawn-out conflict, Syracuse, Sicily's most important city-state, was able to grow in stature and confidence. Finally defeating Athens, it made itself famous for centuries to come. In recent times, President John F. Kennedy made a similar mistake in his attitude to Fidel Castro of Cuba, his failed invasion at the Bay of Pigs, in 1961, made Castro an international hero. A second danger, if you succeed in crushing the irritant, or even if you merely wound it, you create sympathy for the weaker side. Critics of Franklin D. Roosevelt complained bitterly about the money his administration spent on government projects, had their attacks had no resonance with the public, who saw the president as working to end the Great Depression. His opponents thought they had an example that would show just how wasteful he had become, his dog, Fala, which he lavished with favors and attention. Critics railed at his insensitivity spending taxpayers' money on a dog while so many Americans were still in poverty. But Roosevelt had a response, how dare his critics attack a defenseless little dog? His speech in defense of Fala was one of the most popular he ever gave, in this case, the weak party involved was the president's dog and the attack backfired in the long run, it only made the president more sympathetic, since many people will naturally side with that underdog, just as the American public came to sympathize with the wily but outnumbered Pancho Villa. It is tempting to want to fix our mistakes, but the harder we try, the worse we often make them, it is sometimes more politic to leave them alone. In 1971, when the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers, a group of government documents about the history of U.S. involvement in Indochina, Henry Kissinger erupted into a volcanic rage. Furious about the Nixon administration's vulnerability to this kind of damaging leak, he made recommendations that eventually led to the formation of a group. Called the plumbers to plug the leaks. This was the unit that later broke into Democratic Party offices in the Watergate Hotel, setting off the chain of events that led to Nixon's downfall. In reality the publication of the Pentagon Papers was not a serious threat to the administration, but Kissinger's reaction made it a big deal. In trying to fix one problem, he created another, a paranoia for security that in the end was much more destructive to the government had he ignored the Pentagon Papers, the scandal they had created would eventually have blown over. Instead of inadvertently focusing attention on a problem, making it seem worse by publicizing how much concern and anxiety it is causing you, it is often far wiser to play the contemptuous aristocrat, not deigning to acknowledge the problem's existence, there are several ways to execute this strategy. First there is the sour grapes approach. If there is something you want but that you realize you cannot have, the worst thing you can do is draw attention to your disappointment by complaining about it an infinitely more powerful tactic is to act as if it never really interested you in the first place. 
when the writer George Sand supporters nominated her to be the first female member of the Academy Francaise in 1861, Sand quickly saw that the Academy would never admit her. Instead of whining, though, she claimed she had no interest in belonging to this group of worn-out, overrated, out-of-touch windbags. Her disdain was the perfect response, had she shown her anger at her exclusion, she would have revealed how much it meant to her. Instead, she branded the Academy a club of old men and why should she be angry or disappointed at not having to spend her time with them? Crying sour grapes is sometimes seen as a reflection of the weak, it is actually the tactic of the powerful. Second, when you are attacked by an inferior, deflect people's attention by making it clear that the attack has not even registered. Look away, or answer sweetly, showing how little the attack concerns you. Similarly, when you yourself have committed a blunder, the best response is often to make less of your mistake by treating it lightly. The Japanese Emperor Gosaing, a great disciple of the tea ceremony, owned a priceless antique tea bowl that all the courtiers envied. One day a guest, Danigan Tsunahiro, asked if he could carry the tea bowl into the light, to examine it more closely. The bowl rarely left the table, but the emperor was in good spirits and he consented. As Danigan carried the bowl to the railing of the veranda, however, and held it up to the light, it slipped from his hands and fell on a rock in the garden below, smashing into tiny fragments. The emperor of course was furious. It was indeed most clumsy of me to let it drop in this way, said Danigan, with a deep bow, but really there is not much harm done. This Edo tea bowl is a very old one and it is impossible to say how much longer it would have lasted, but anyhow it is not a thing of any public use, so I think it rather fortunate that it has broken thus. This surprising response had an immediate effect, the emperor calmed down. Danigan neither snivelled nor over-apologized, but signaled his own worth and power by treating his mistake with a touch of disdain. The emperor had to respond with a similar aristocratic indifference, his anger had made him seem low and petty an image Danigan was able to manipulate. Among equals this tactic might backfire, your indifference could make you seem callous. But with a master, if you act quickly and without great fuss, it can work to great effect, you bypass his angry response, save him the time and energy he would waste by brooding over it, and allow him the opportunity to display his own lack of pettiness publicly. If we make excuses and denials when we are caught in a mistake or a deception, we stir the waters and make the situation worse. It is often wiser to play things the opposite way. The Renaissance writer Pietro Artino often boasted of his aristocratic lineage, which was, of course, a fiction, since he was actually the son of a shoemaker. When an enemy of his finally revealed the embarrassing truth, word quickly spread, and soon all of Venice, where he lived at the time, was aghast at Aretino's lies. Had he tried to defend himself, he would have only dragged himself down. His response was masterful, he announced that he was indeed the son of a shoemaker, but this only proved his greatness, since he had risen from the lowest stratum of society to its very pinnacle. From then on he never mentioned his previous lie, trumpeting instead his new position on the matter of his ancestry. Remember, the powerful responses to niggling, petty annoyances and irritations are contempt and disdain. Never show that something has affected you, or that you are offended that only shows you have acknowledged a problem. Contempt is a dish that is best served cold and without affectation. You must play the card of contempt with care and delicacy. Most small troubles will vanish on their own if you leave them be, but some will grow and fester unless you attend to them. Ignore a person of inferior stature and the next time you look he has become a serious rival, and your contempt has made him vengeful as well. The great princes of Renaissance Italy chose to ignore Césaire Borgia at the outset of his career as a young general in the army of his father, Pope Alexander VI. By the time they paid attention it was too late the cub was now a hun, gobbling up chunks of Italy. Often, then, while you show contempt publicly you will also need to keep an eye on the problem privately, monitoring its status and making sure it goes away. Do not let it become a cancerous cell. Develop the skill of sensing problems when they are still small and taking care of them before they become intractable. Learn to distinguish between the potentially disastrous and the mildly irritating, the nuisance that will quietly go away on its own. In either case, though, never completely take your eye off it. As long as it is alive it can smolder and spark into life.